Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Money Control Masterclass, a show where we try to break down uh, the latest developments for you with an expert panel of speakers. What are we discussing today? Well, this is something that Infosys definitely doesn't like. It's something that Wipro has fired hundreds of employees for, and it could be something why TCS is calling people back to work compulsively thrice a week. On the other hand, Swiggy, though, has a policy that enables this. What are we talking about? We're talking about the raging debate around moonlighting. Is it cheating, uh, plain and simple, or is it the new normal, the new reality that we have to grapple with? Joining me on the debate then, we have Mohandas Pai, T.N. Hari, uh, Shriram Rajkopal, as well as Aditya Narayan Mishra, all of them have you know, run HR functions in IT companies, new age companies. They also consult many leading companies and we're looking forward to some fiery views. But let me start with what is moonlighting in the first place. If you look at, look at the technical definition, it's you know basically a second employment. That's the se uh, technical definition of apart from your primary job. Um, I just want to ask, you know get your opening thoughts. I mean, it's very vitiated the the way this uh, you know uh, debate has turned out. On the one hand, you have Wipro Chairman Rishad Premji who has said it's you know, absolutely bad um, and uh, it's a complete uh, a fall in integrity. On the other hand, you have companies like Swiggy enabling moonlighting. You have CP Gurdani of Tech Mahindra who's open to it. So, you know, Nagpur oranges, take them fresh. Over 200 fruits and vegetables delivered fresh to your home. Mr. Pai, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, Chandra, let me start by saying employment is a contract between an employer and employee and the contract laid down the terms if the contract says you cannot work for anybody else without a permission or you cannot work at all you have to comply or you have to leave the employment let's be clear about that if the contract does not say so you can work but at the same time some standards have to be followed you can't work for a direct competitor and I think that's very unethical because there is some confidentiality, IP issues in IT companies and other companies. And of course, you cannot work at the time you are given to your employer for which the employer pays you your compensation. In the Bipro case, I think when uh, Rishad made the statement, he must have found out people who were working for his named competitor. And that's why he was very shocked and he must have made the statement. And that's what seems to come when the 300 people were sacked because they worked for the competitor. Uh, they must have been working for somebody during the time they're supposed to be working for Vipro. You know, people are capable of many things. But, you know, in principle, we must now look at a situation where people will be able to work somewhere on the free time with some caveats, not work for a direct competitor, not use your company or your employer's equipment, not use their IP, blah, 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 some things. Now, you spoke about Swiggy allowing it. I mean, I don't give many credence to what Swiggy says because if Swiggy has got uh, people who deliver, they can work for anybody, right? I mean, it's of no consequence. If Swiggy has got people in technology working for them, will they allow them to work for Zomato in the uni? I don't know. And that's the question to ask Swiggy because some of these people make these comments in a very loose connection because they got so many contractual employees uh, who are under no uh, contract not to work for anybody else because they're all individual contractors and they're contracted only when they go to an app and touch an app. But I think the time has come uh, for people to look at the subject. So far, people are not looking at it, primarily because this is not a big issue. But in the last many, many months, three things have happened. One, because of COVID, people are working from home. And that means most people have one to four hours more at their disposal because they work from home, no commute, etc. Second, all the gig economy has become much, much bigger. And I think more approaches are put up on the web. And third, uh, many new companies have come up which can break up the work and give you work so you can work three hours, four hours a day round the, round the clock uh, in the U.S. workday time and get paid in dollars. So the opportunities are expanded, technology expanded. So I guess, you know, everything is worked to make sure this, is, this can happen. But I think we need a debate to say when can we allow in what circumstances, et cetera, and we need to be more liberal. Right. Hari, you know, you have very strong views for this. In fact, in a recent column that you wrote for us, you said unreasonable employers will find it hard to attract and retain talent. 
and you know the way people are employed has also changed this is not your fixed factory hours labor but knowledge workers who are you know who end up working unlimited hours so expecting underpaid workers to work unlimited hours by restricting what they can and cannot do in their free time is the central issue but if you look at what mr pai said you know it's a very valid point swiggy is okay with a moonlighting policy because they have a huge proportion of contractual workers who are not bound to anyone will they be okay if someone from their core technology team who is managing the app is also working for somato yeah so i think uh, let me respond to this comprehensively i'll talk about uh, swiggy as well so i think uh, employers are well within their rights to impose reasonable restrictions on what their employees do so i think working two jobs at a time is probably a no no and I, I, and my own sense is that the word you know uh, moonlighting is interpreted in multiple ways and if we interpret moonlighting as doing two full time jobs you know for two different companies i think it's a no brainer and we don't even need to be on this call discussing this there are no nothing to be discussed so i think it's a fairly reasonable restriction that they can impose and i think working for 8 9 hours or giving 45 hours a week to a company i think is also a fair expectation and i think that's a reasonable restriction to impose but then i think you know moonlighting is meant and understood in very different ways for example we are also hearing things like you know what if you work in the night for somebody else then probably you will get tired and you will not be as productive working for us that i think is a very trivial and silly argument because where do you draw that line for example you could be working for someone else or you could be you know working for doing some community work or you could be you know working for your resident welfare association you could be teaching your children you know mathematics at night or you could be binge watching serials you could be so doing so many things which could probably impact your productivity next day but you know therefore but you can't place or any of those restrictions on people if people are not productive and if they're not delivering the outcomes that's expected of them please take action you have a performance management system to take action on people who are not delivering the outcomes you don't need to really monitor what they do in their free time so my own belief is that you know as long as restrictions on moonlighting is about not doing multiple full time jobs i think it's okay as long as it's about you know giving us 45 hours a week i think it's perfectly all right but saying what you will do and will not do you know is in your free time is completely unfair and also expecting you know what in in our office premises you won't do anything else that's also equally unfair because you know what today work is not bunched up back to back over a 9 hour period you know there are times in which you have a lot of slack and if companies are not expecting you to do any other work in their office premises how can they expect you to do their work in your premises because people go back home and work for the company in their premises so i think it, everything should be fair i think it has to be based on trust and it has to be based on mutual respect for each other and i come to this point again you know what which is about unlimited hours that is the real expectation and that's where the problem is which is that you have signed on to do a full time job with us it's not 45 hours you are expected to be available to us for unlimited hours over weekends at any time of the day or night i think that's completely unreasonable and unfair if rishad prem ji is meaning to say that people shouldn't be working for two companies or working for a direct competitor i think it's very fair you know uh, expectation but i i don't know that's what he means and that's what most other people who are placing restrictions on employees actually mean now let me just come to swiggy for a moment i don't think swiggy is talking of the blue collar delivery folks at all blue collar delivery folks everybody knows is are operating in a gig model and they work for multiple employers they're not even employees they are contractors who work for multiple you know companies i think swiggy clearly means that their white collar workforce is free to do stuff in their free time obviously they will not be allowed to write code for zomato they are because zomato is a direct competitor so they have clarified you know within reasonable restrictions you cannot be doing things which conflict with our core business interests so uh, swiggy will not permit the tech team to write code for zomato but they will certainly permit the tech team to do other things in their free time as long as they're not working for a direct competitor or doing things which you know disclose uh, you know confidential information or you know uh, uh, the tech stuff that uh, swiggy that gives swiggy its competitive advantage so i don't think that they're talking about the blue collar workforce at all they're very seriously talking about the white collar workforce and saying that they can do gigs in their free time paid or unpaid and i think that's the important point mr bai would you like to respond to that uh 
I think uh, we are in agreement largely. I don't see what is the difference between Hari and me because we are saying that uh, you had to work for the time you are paid with your employer. You can't work elsewhere. And you are saying in a free time, you should not be restrictions. There are many things that are not uh, work for others where you can do what you want. And even if you do a work uh, in the unions when you're free, it should be fine so long it's not against the name competitor. But doing what do you make of this point? What do you make of this point where, you know, in if you're in the office premise and, you know, you've done your job for the day and you have some free time, you can work on your side projects uh, because, you know, companies don't think twice about, you know, making you work at home. So are no, these no, perhaps no, no. some of the things they should be flexible about? Chandra, work from because home. Because you're on call literally 24 by 7. You can't say I'm at home, so I'm not going to work. Chandra, Chandra, 24, have points, 24 into 7 without compensation is a no no. Let's agree on that, okay? Employment means that a number of hours for which you are compensated. If you say that you're bonded labor to me and you got to work 24 into 7, I'll pay you for 9 hours, that is not acceptable. Let's be clear about that, okay? We are not debating that. The key thing is if I'm in my employer's office, and I, 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 you know, in my free time there I work. I don't think that's right. I'm staying in somebody's property. I may be using their equipment. Or maybe I'm using my laptop. I may be using their Wi-Fi. There are conflicts. Now, you spoke about uh, working from somebody's home. Now, that's a privilege. That means I choose to work from my home and the employer gives me connectivity, equipment, whatever it is there. So during the time when I'm logged on to work for the employee, where I promise the employee I'll work for the time, I must not work anywhere. But during my free time, I can do what I want. So I think we've got to be very clear what is possible, what is not possible, so that conflicts like this are resolved and trust is ensured. And trust comes when both people keep their side of the bargain. 24 into 7 hour call and work is not acceptable. You know, let's be clear about that. Okay. Um, Shriram, you know, it's also interesting that most of the commentary that we've seen coming on Moonlighting um, is coming from IT companies, you know, uh, Infosys, Wipro, Tech Mahindra, and today TCS, uh, I mean, we did a story yesterday where they've mandated that employees need to come into the office thrice a week, they will be rostered, if they don't comply, then, you know, action will be taken, very stern message going out to employees. Now, you know, we went through a survey that Kotak Institution of Equities did a few months ago, and they surveyed 400 IT, ITES employees in July. And this revealed that 65% of respondents were either engaged in part-time opportunities during work from home or knew a colleague that was. So again, this moonlighting, is it, I mean, what makes the IT industry more susceptible to it? And, you know, is it getting blown out, blown out of proportion, an issue that is perhaps, you know, affecting one industry or one sector? See, the IT industry is the largest employer uh, and the fastest growing employment market or the labor market that, uh, that we know of uh, in India. Uh, two things that I'd, uh, I'd like to point out, like Mr. Pai said, there is in India exclusivity of employment, which means that for the time that you get paid, you got to work for the company that uh, that is paying you, uh, irrespective of whether you have work or not. Even if you're in production support, I may have only two or three tickets to uh, uh, cater to, but uh, I have a lot of time in my hand. But that's uh, the expectation is uh, set because there is a fear that if you work for a competitor or around the same time, there is a lot of IP intensive work that you do for customers that uh, that uh, that may be transferred to somebody else and that is because they are finally liable to their customers right so that's the one of the reasons that i feel that uh, it is viewed strongly uh, by uh, technology companies because of that they have the liability uh, if something goes wrong with their uh, their customers um, and also for the fact that this is the industry that sort of went remote first uh, when the pandemic happened um, and uh, a lot of ODC restrictions that were placed uh, in companies where people had to come into the office, deposit their mobile phones, you know, all very stringent restrictions. You can't even take printer paper out of uh, some of these ODCs that completely went away uh, on account of the pandemic. And uh, people are comf comfortable today working from home. Now, that sudden change in policy uh, uh, allowed for some bad practice, right? So while majority of the workforce is, uh, uh, you know, fairly honest, uh, there is some level of uh, trust issue that's crept in because of these uh, people that are 
uh, engaging in dual employment. And that's when, when it's discovered, that's, uh, then you start suspecting, um, you know, who else is out there doing the same thing. Um, and that's where uh, all of this is coming from. And, and coupled to the fact that there's a lot more of um, fake candidates coming through uh, the system. Uh, so putting it all together, there is that level of, uh, you know, uh, apprehension that uh, employers have about allowing moonlighting and then, you know, uh, making it uh, applicable to all when that's such, they, they, they don't have control over that. Uh, that's, uh, that's in my opinion, what is what's happening. Right. There. But Sriram, what's the, you know, I mean, have you come across examples where people are holding multiple jobs, you know, give us examples of how they are pulling it off? See, I'll give you extreme examples, right? So we, we met uh, one of our clients today <laughs> who is working for 30 companies, right? And he got caught because there are 30 uh, PF contributions coming through some unified account number. Are you saying one person is work is is working 30 for 30 jobs. people, 30 so jobs? He, he has a garage where he has 30 people employed. <laughs> every work, every customer laptop is given to the guys that uh, that work for him. So you might as well have started an IT services company and done this. Well, that he way. started up his own <laughs> subcontracting <laughs> outfit. Is this in so Bangalore? Like, like I said, no, it's Chennai. <laughs> uh, so it's an extreme example. But, but we are have you allowed? That. Are you allowed to get 30 PF contributions in a month? If it's unchecked, you know, somebody had the sense to go and check. There is just one UAN number, right? How is this happening? Doesn't matter. A PF doesn't check. Uh, you know, how do they get? They're getting more contributions. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one extreme example. But like I said, uh, two jobs are of this population. It's more common, right? Where you get caught with another employment. That's where it's. I see. The challenge right if moonlighting is construed as dual employment then i think we have a problem but there's like uh hari said there's a lot more options where uh, you know i could do something with my free time right provide interview as a service you know contribute to a body of knowledge or uh, whatever else i can get uh, paid for right so there are companies that give you time uh, to get your perspective right? that's uh, paid for so it's just about allowing uh, with those caveats uh, what uh, you can do with the time that you have at hand uh, after you've given that 45 hours for uh, your current employer. Right. I just wanted to oh. add to this, Chandra. Yes. Uh, I just, uh, uh, take a second only. So I think, you know, this guy working for 30 companies, I mean, while he may be violating a particular company's law, I think what he's doing is very interesting. And these companies must sit back and figure out, you know what, uh, why do they even need to employ somebody like this? Is he stuck in a boring job? Is the kind of work exciting? Can it be outsourced to somebody very junior who's working in a garage? I think companies need to sit back and think about these bigger issues rather than worrying too much about whether a guy is violating the company law. In fact, I would add um, that there is, because of this explosion of growth of companies, there is some level of redundancy. Right? So there is, you know, some, uh, I, I don't know, I think you saw a Google uh, Sundar Pichai's report that uh, we're going to reduce our workforce by 20% because there is 20% fat in the system. Uh, so that may be uh, what's prompting some of the some of the folks that I have so much time at my hand. What do I do with it? Uh, even though it's not allowed, but there is a temptation to just uh, put it to productive use. You know, we've uh, looked at this from an employer perspective, from an employee perspective. But um, uh, Aditya, if, Narayan Mishra, if you can give us the client perspective. I mean, if I'm a client working with company A uh, and, you know, then the company decides to institute this moonlighting policy, which will give their employees flexibility. Um, am I going to be OK with that from a client perspective? Yeah, I don't see any issue why a client will have a problem with this um, because the client is interested only in getting the things done and to ensure that the work which is being done is being done in a in an environment which is protected, which is secure and their information is uh, uh, intact. There is it is not getting compromised. So as long as the company is able to ensure all of this the client will not have an issue uh, so i don't think that's that's any trouble at all i think the companies here have to be a little more progressive in their thinking uh, and be a little more accepting of the 
current uh, situation that we are in, the uh, remote work uh, has been established as a model. And then, uh, so even if you get people for three days a week, there are still two other days when people are working from home. I think the whole point is about trust. All I think all, there is no confusion about people working for rivals at the same time. It is not possible. It is unethical. It is cheating. There is no problem with that. But the problem is the gray area comes into picture when somebody, let's say I am a, a software developer, I am trying to do some work for my let's say okay, i'm building a small software for my resident owners association to collect the dues so what's the problem with that or i'm trying to help okay, you know my friend who's trying to develop a, a small game related to chess because i am interested in chess as a game and i want to do this as long as i'm not compromising on the deliverables with my employment contract with my employer, this should be all encouraged. I think our policy of the organization should be so transparent that people are able to declare honestly and with respect that somebody is doing something more than work. And possibly the manager has to take a note of this fact that this person is looking for certain stimulation, certain challenging work, which I am not able to, or my organization is not able to provide. So maybe if I have this additional information, I'll be tapped into this person's intellect, capability, and interest in some way. So our workplace, I think, in some way could be so holistic, so interesting. Right. Mr. Pai, did you want to say something on the client no, part of it? No, no. Look, look. I, I don't agree that uh, a client should not bother the person who works elsewhere. Please remember the client has a confidentiality agreement with the vendor or the supplier, right? And the supplier's employees have to ensure that the confidentiality agreement is carried through. Now, if you have a client, uh, let us say, uh, GE, which makes aircraft engines, and then you also work for Pratt and Mitni, which makes aircraft engines. I think there is a conflict. So you've got to be careful. Uh, that you know you 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 ensure the contracts are done but uh, it is true that if so long as you put in the client's work if you work elsewhere which are not in direct conflict i think it's fine but i think we should not take examples of saying i do some voluntary work in my free time i don't think anybody will object to voluntary work i do some small small things with my friend i don't think anybody will do the key is when you do regular work through a platform uh, jig work are you work in the technology with the competitors and other, that is where the matter is concerned. So I think we need to write out what are the things that can be done for which nobody will have an objection and what are the things that require prior approval or information or disclosure in case you do it and what are the things that cannot be done so that there's transparency both sides. But Chandra, the last point I want to make is, look, a lot of it can go away if you pay people better. You know, people who are working up to five years don't get paid well. You know the story, right? They're not seeing the increase in compensation. Yeah, in fact, I was just going to ask you about that. Uh, I was just going through a data point. If you look at the IT CEO pay, it's shot up by 835% in a decade, while the fresher salary grew 45% at the same time. So a lot of people, you know, who were opposed to Rashad Premji's view, they were, you know, saying that you're paying peanuts. So why should we not look yeah. for other avenues of employment? Why don't you just raise... The salary for freshers. I, I totally agree. I think it's totally unfair. You see, Chandra, why I'm disappointed is I've been in the industry since 1994. We built this industry on fairness. We built this industry on saying that everybody is adequately compensated. We built this industry on making sure the senior people get the raise only after the juniors and others are taken care of. We built this industry on the principle that when there's a crisis, the seniors take the largest pay cuts and the juniors don't take any pay cuts and they're well protected. Now, everything has been turned into the head. We're following this American machinery model where senior people's salary keeps going up and you exploit the people at the bottom and pay them peanuts. Now, I don't see why they should not protest. They're naturally protesting and they're very angry and upset because they can't keep body and soul together. And it's wrong for any of these companies which claim to be ethical, which came to be fair, we came to be model employers, not to pay the people at the bottom well for the last 10 years. They're not raised much salary like you gave the data. The data is very clear, Chandra. 
that is the problem they have to solve for them to have the model standing to tell anybody we should not do moonlighting you are bonded to us for 24 into 7 you can't work for anybody first they must raise the salaries and prove their bona fides none of them have done that that is the biggest challenge and that's why i'm really upset and angry with this industry but mr bai you could have also done this when you were cfo of infosys and hr head of yeah, infosys i left in 2011 chandra please remember till i was there i used to do it every year increase you know, in the, in the financial crisis, we cut our compensation the highest. You talk to Narayan Murthy, he'll give you all the details too. You're close to him because we did that. I left in 2011. Remember, this is a long time ago. Okay. Hari, um, and you know, Mr. Pai, you can also weigh in on this. One other thing that people are citing is the stance that companies take on moonlighting seems to be restricted to the junior levels and mid levels. But you know, you have board members, you have chairpersons, you have other top executives who have roles in multiple boards. They have their side projects and consulting. And you know, people seem to be okay with that. So why should a company have different policies at the junior mid levels? And why should they have different policies at the senior levels? Isn't that a double standard? Both of you can weigh in on this. Okay. Hari, I think you're on mute. Yeah, so I think I'll get back to your specific question in a moment, Chandra. But let me allow, allow me to just comment on what MDP just said which is, I think I have a lot of respect for him and I largely agree with him, but where I think I have a slight disagreement is as follows. So I think I completely agree with MDP that, you know what, um, the people at the bottom of the pyramid in IT services companies are underpaid. They are actually blue collar workers dressed in white. And uh, one question is, should you then solve the problem of, uh, you know, doing side gigs by paying them better? My question is, my point is that it might be difficult to do that because industry also, the industry has certain, you know, drivers of profitability and if they begin to pay the people at the bottom of the pyramid or a very large number of them high salaries then this industry may not even survive their margins will get eroded in no time so i think the best thing and the smart thing for you know industry to do to preserve their profitability to help people you know earn a little more is to lay down the guidelines very clearly in terms of what they can and cannot do with their free time so, for example, as MDP also said, if you lay out what they cannot do, I think that would be wonderful. For example, if you say you can't do two full-time jobs with and one full-time job with us and no other full-time job, that I think is a good restriction. But you, you know, and you can impose a few other restrictions as well and say you for these things you need to take permission to do. And for the rest of the things, you know, don't even need to take permission. For example, if you're not working for a competitor and working four hours for an American company doing code for them, which is not even competing for you with you, there's no need to even take permission. So I think if the, it's laid out in black and white, things will become much better. And the people, you know, who are so-called underpaid, they will also be able to earn a certain income on the side. Now coming to, you know, the question that you asked, which is about uh, are we applying this standard or is everyone applying the standard uniformly across the hierarchy? So I think, you know what, as long as you say that no one is allowed to do two full time jobs at the same time, then a director, you know, or a very senior executive being an independent director is not actually doing two full time jobs. Yeah. So that's perfectly all right. But if you define moonlighting as, you know, you can't do anything else on the side, then that must apply for everyone as well, which is no one can do. It should be able to do anything on the side, which is a senior exec shouldn't be allowed to be an advisor in some other, you know, a venture fund or maybe in an in other company as an independent director. So I think the standards have to be applied uniformly. So I think what is not clear is the understanding and definition of moonlighting. Are, are people generally, those who are speaking up very loudly against moonlighting, are they just saying that you can't do two jobs? If that is the case, then there's no need to even debate or discuss this. But if they're saying, you know what, there are so many other restrictions that we will impose on you, which is what you can and cannot do during your free time, everything you need to take permission from us, I think that's unfair. And therefore, the same standards need to apply to the, those at the senior level as well. Right. Mr. Bai, the, the point on, you know, whether people are treating this differently for different levels of em, uh, employees? Different you know, senior employees, employees, senior employees should not have another full-time job, not consult for anybody. They must devote all their time. Because I am on record to say, managers and above have a fiduciary obligation. And the fiduciary obligation requires them to discharge their duty fully to the company. And they must be on call 24 into 7 because they're part of the managerial cadre 
and they should be ready to come in an emergency. I think that's very important for them to understand. And that's why they're called managers. All right. Now, the second point is, if I'm a, a senior person and if I seek the board of approval to be a director on the board, non-whole time that independent director, because the board believes also that I will get a better exposure and education, uh, that's quite okay because it is by permission. And you cannot be without permission. Nobody can go elsewhere and consult without permission because that will be against the employment contract. And that will be very rare. And now, independent directors are independent directors. They can be on multiple boards. The law allows that. So I don't think you should bother about that. But I agree, the same rule should apply to everybody because, Chandra, leadership by example is sign quo and non for a manager. If you are a manager, you are a leader. And if you are a leader, you have a differential policy like in the old companies, MNCs, you had a special toilet for the officers and, uh, you know, general toilet for the staff, like in uh, North Block. That's not okay. A leader should be a leader and leadership by example. You must sacrifice the most. You must take the pain the most and you must lead by example. Otherwise, you're not fit to be a manager. That principle should apply. Okay. Since we're talking about moonlighting policies, uh, Sriram, you know, if companies were to come up with a moonlighting policy, what would that entail? Can we get to a point where managers would be comfortable uh, accepting that, you know, employees may be doing something else as well in their free time? See, it's about establishing that trust, right? I think uh, in the last one year, that trust got eroded because of, you know, multiple uh, issues. One, the aspect of dual employment, which is kind of you know, the moonlighting is a catchphrase that uh, sort of captures it all uh, but that's what everybody is trying to fight uh, second is uh, you know the the level of fake candidates uh, coming through uh, the system um, but if you set that aside i think companies are uh, can uh, set up a flexible employment contracts for people who who don't want the you know uh, constraints of a regular employment contract uh, and then it's easy to define what uh, what will be allowed and uh, you know how much time you uh, devote to what you get paid for. Uh, it's very very clear because in the U.S. there is no exclusivity of employment. In India there is, right? So you can work in uh, uh, you know cognizant <coughs> in, in the morning and then work in Applebee's in the evening. So it's it's perfectly okay. But again, going back to Hari and MDP's point, uh, as long as it doesn't conflict and it's not a direct competitor that you, it's not like Coke and Pepsi, right? So uh, it's, it, it's easy to define um, what you uh, cannot do, right? That's, uh, and then everything else is, uh, you know, if you want to make money on the side after your work hours, it's, uh, uh, it's actually beneficial and not take that load on uh, your PNL to increase uh, compensation. If there is an opportunity, uh, because y many of these companies do use gig platforms to get that work done. So can your employees not participate <laughs> in that gig platform and uh, uh, get paid a little bit more? Uh, if you're okay to pay somebody else, why not pay your own folks who will volunteer for that gig? That's a good point. That's a good point. Wonderful point. I really compliment you on that. Because if you're going to jig platforms and taking people, do you ask them, are you working for any employer? Assure me that you're not using that employer's time. Assure me that you don't have conflict. You don't ask, right? You know, you just put it up, somebody comes and works and you pay him and take care of it. Why not for your employees? Great point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But uh, Sriram, you know, I'm curious, um, can a company technically catch people who are moonlighting? I mean, Wipro is one example. Um, we are still trying to figure out, you know, did they use UN numbers, TDS, what, what, how they caught this. But uh, is that also going to perhaps become a focus? Will there be more sophisticated tools going forward? Can you technically catch employees who are moonlighting? How, how are they going to deal with this? Uh... It's very difficult. It, see, if dual employment, where I am really stupid enough to go and get two regular <laughs> jobs and have uh, two companies contribute to uh, your PF, that's when you get caught. If I'm a contractor in another company and an FTE here and I can, you know, pay GST, there is no way you can uh, figure it out. Okay. And uh, in fact, we see people who let's say do interview as a service because you know this uh, entire explosion in hiring last year with the uh, 50% joining rate allowed uh, did you say interview as a service yeah there is there's a service uh, so you get paid by the number of interviews you do 
so these are people who you know bill through their mom's name or their wife's name and uh, so you know the, you you use an alias when you come uh, come into the uh, interviewing platforms you don't uh, see if the company allowed it they, they wouldn't have to do this right if something like that is uh, okay for you to do i might as well disclose who i am so today <laughs> there is a fear that i may be interviewing the comp- you know my junior <laughs> from uh, <laughs> if i went to the platform so Uh, you know a lot of people use alias name so it's very difficult to find out if you're doing something like that right if you are if the intent is to cheat there is always a way to uh mm-hmm. cheat because we see people providing uh, support for proxy interviews right and and uh, the proxy interviews cost you 40000 bucks uh, so to give you first round interview second round interview i just impersonate you and go and sit in the uh, interview and then it's all the way all the way to onboarding because the onboarding is also remote so the primary reason for people wanting people to come back to work is to you know basically take care of that aspect mm. of it right so because the minute you come then you can't work with two laptops inside the office you can't bring uh, you know uh, so a lot of those you issues... can't run an outfit where you have 30 people with 30 laptops <laughs> so that so yeah yeah it's okay. very difficult to figure out right uh, mr mishra do you think this will also lead to changes in the way employee contracts are structured will it companies be perhaps more open to contractual uh, labor or gig labor just want to understand if this will have you know more ramifications so i think it will have many ramifications not only for the it companies for the industry in general so we may be talking in the context of it but the same applies for teachers doctors nurses sales executive uh, many finance people accounting people they, many of them take on something or the other on the side so uh, time has come we have learned from it that what is right and what is ethically right what should be permitted Uh, if all of this as a policy can evolve across the industry i'm sure every organization can adapt to this and restructure the employment contracts with uh, insertion of some new clauses and all of that uh, okay, i think the structure that uh, hari was referring to that a few things which are not allowed a few things which you need to seek permission and a few things where you need not seek permission from uh, that kind of a structuring of this policy and employment contract will come and i think uh, yeah it's going to happen and uh, the the uh, second small point i want to add is that we have now the world of work is uh, sort of uh, today comprising of multiple kinds of employment i think many more industries are going to use it traditionally people talked about full time employment and contractual employment that's it maybe some talked about part time some talked about uh, you know uh, job rotation job sharing and a few others but in india typically we talked about only largely two kinds of hiring uh, uh, employment one is the full time employment another is part time but now a time has come that there are various kinds of employment and various kinds of employment engagements which will also come that's my belief got it in fact interestingly the uh, it minister rajiv chandrasekhar has also waded into the moonlighting debate and he said that companies should not pin their employees and put a lid on their dreams they should be allowed to do what they want with no restrictions interesting views there but um, uh, hari you know i also want to draw your attention to what uh, infosys co-founder chris gopalakrishnan said recently he said that if you want to build trust you should be working for one organization now does that view still hold does it still stand that you know if you stay in one company for long enough you will be rewarded because employees do think otherwise at least on the salary front i think that's a very outmoded point of view that's not relevant in our times i think uh, you need to keep pace with the way things are evolving i think there are two ways in which people adapt or respond to change one is they keep sticking to their old views and hope that the world does not change and there are those who figure out you know that it's better to ride along with the change and embrace change proactively i think uh, probably you know the view that you expressed i think is outmoded 
So I think uh, salaried employment is probably the least rewarding employment for most smart people these days. Smart people would want to do multiple gigs. They would look for fulfillment outside of boring jobs. As some, you know, someone said, you know, if there are two tickets or three tickets to be, you know, disposed of, and you have the whole day with you and doing nothing else, twiddling your thumbs, you are stuck in an unfulfilling job. The company might impose restriction and say, you know what, you can't do anything for eight hours. But is is that the right thing to do? Is that a smart thing to do? Certainly not. I think so. Companies need to begin to think about why folks are moonlighting. What is it in our work structure that is so unrewarding that they need to go out? Because as MDP said, you know, at more senior levels, people are slightly reluctant to, you know, moonlight or do multiple things because they have fa- they are fairly well paid and also have reasonably fulfilling jobs. I will have some questions on the latter, but I think at least they're reasonably well paid. So my own sense is that, you know, companies must review their positions and uh, be open to, you know, all kinds of new uh, employment contracts uh, uh, that are c- coming up. The world of work is you know, changing every day, it's important to be able to keep pace. Otherwise, uh, you will end up as an unreasonable, you know, dinosaur whose point of view is no longer relevant or, you know, you will never be able to attract the smart people. Mr. Pai, do you agree? No, no, I agree to a great extent. Look, my fundamental premise is one. Uh, You know, Chris said that you must have trust. I mean, trust requires you to give trust. Why have you not paid your employees better for last 10, 11 years? Why are you exploiting their condition? You have not kept your part of the bargain and you want them to trust you and leave in hope for long and look at your senior people compensation. Where is the, where is the fairness? If you're very fair, you take care of everybody, you, you know, are very strict in enforcement. Yes, you have a right to say you have to build trust and trust has to be both sides. Trust cannot be one side. If you treat people like widgets and tell them you're nothing but a you know, person who has to come, I own you and I'll pay you what I want when you join me and you got to work, that will not do. See, trust is a very big word. And trust means both sides trust each other. And you have to create conditions where the trust is possible. And if you don't do that, I mean, I don't understand what is the value of this uh, trust. And that's why people are living with 20-25% attrition, right? And I think that's a very important thing that the industry must ask. And I don't think paying this, you know, paying one or two lakhs more per year for the junior people is going to dent the profitability of anybody. For example, Chandra, if you've seen the accounts of all these people, their subcontractor costs eight to ten percent of the revenues. They can easily change the model a little bit and tweak and pay people better. So I this is a financial excuse. I know the finances very well than most people. That is not an excuse. You've got to pay people well. And second, you know, in the free time, do things. But, you know, Hari made a, 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 a give an example of tickets, right? You know, the tickets are not there. But please remember, the client is paying you for the full day. And you're supposed to be available for the day for which the client is paying you. There may be one ticket, two tickets. The client is paying you full day. Client is not paying you by ticket. If the client is paying you by ticket, then you can say the employee can do what they want. Because you're not, and you're also not paying the employee by ticket. So, you know, look, we have to create conditions where there are no conflicts of interest. They have fairness both sides. There's great flexibility. Like one of the members said, you know, understand the gig economy is here. The world has changed. And, you know, be much more liberal. Um, Sriram, you know, this also puts companies in the quandary, right? I mean, as Hari said, why have you made work so unfulfilling that people are looking elsewhere for gigs, elsewhere for jobs? Um, so what can companies really do about this or is this a temporary issue because, you know, the, the talent supply is uh, challenging in the current environment, freshers who have been, uh, you know, hired in the last year, they're still undergoing training. So once the supply side situation gets sorted, people return to office, this whole moonlighting debate will ebb on its own. Just want to get your thoughts there. See, to a certain extent, yes, uh, because industry worked on the premise that everybody needs to come to the office people need to come inside and you know manage everything else now the pandemic has paved way to uh, you know realize that work can be done remotely as long as there is decent connectivity uh, and like i said the examples that we are quoting and the you know uh, uh, extent of uh, the moonlighting or dual employment which is objectionable is very still very limited it's not mainstream Right. The mainstream part, uh, like you said, the 
Kotak study, 65% uh, know somebody who's doing it or they're doing it themselves, is on the one uh, out will be type of activities that will be acceptable to the organization. Uh, I, I'm assuming that that to be the case. So the extremes are the unethical practice of you know working for another competitor, passing on an IP. It's it's not done. That's if you set that aside. Uh, there is, it is easy to make a policy to uh, allow you and to have them declare with trust that you will not uh, take action uh, because you, at least where I have worked, there is an option to declare. Right? So you are doing, you are reading news in the in the night, but you're you're uh, yeah. working. Shira, you day. have acted in movies and all when you were not running HR at conferences. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so the cognizant did allow me to do that. Right? I did disclose I was going to do it. Yeah, uh, does it? Uh, it would have been a problem if you were doing something for Infosys. As long as you are in uh, no, 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 Hollywood, no, no. it wasn't Tendra, an issue. Tendra, <laughs> if you want to be in a movie, you take leave and go. Don't do it during office time. And the Infosys point, you have to disclose. Like you said, you have to go disclose and ask for permission. They'll give permission. See, these are all exceptions. Now we're talking about large number of people doing it because the system yeah. allows you. Earlier, you could go take permission, they'll take permission. Why will not anybody not give you permission? Now, the question is, the technology has made it much simpler. Large amounts of job are available on platform gig economy, and you're severely underpaid. So, the, you're doing it. That's the problem. All of them. Right. See, another but, yeah, go on. point is on the attrition, right? So, you know, organizations are not able to read it. You're, you're in almost a year's yeah. time, you're lost two thirds of yeah. right so how will you build trust when you're you have a leaking bucket that's just uh, yeah. uh, and, and especially with remote work that is i don't think we are able to establish that level of uh, rapport with your workforce and you know many a times the uh, rapport is with the uh, the skill right so i'm a salesforce person i'm an nsap person so my loyalty is because that what that's what gets me the pay right so it's not the organization that i work for i can work for any organization but Hari, you know, I want to ask you a question on what this kind of moonlighting means for, you know, the trajectory of an individual. I mean, we've all grown up thinking that, you know, if I do well in one job, give my 120%, I grow with the organization, I develop expertise in something, um, you know, I'm known for that. Now I'm working on multiple projects, you know, I'm not giving my 100% to any one project. I mean, okay, fine, I make some quick buck, you know, in the short term, but what will this mean for an individual in the long term? See, I think this is a very good point, but it goes back to what uh, MTP also mentioned time and again, which is that uh, not many people are seriously interested in long term careers in organizations. If you just look at the pyramids in many of these IT services companies, they tend to be extremely bottom heavy and not many people get an opportunity to climb that ladder and go up. So I think a lot of people are grappling with existential issues, which is that they're earning 30,000 rupees a month and paying the rent of 10,000 rupees, paying you know expenses of 10,000 and you know education loans of the remaining 10,000. They're grappling with existential issues. And for them, therefore, moonlighting is important and earning a side income is extremely important. The other thing is that, you know, besides, uh, you know, uh, people who are underpaid, Sometimes it's always helpful to do things on the side because it gives you a sense of fulfillment because sometimes what happens is that you can't derive your entire satisfaction and happiness from the work you're doing. However, you know, the organization might design it for you. So I think doing some things on the side that fulfill your passion and sometimes there could be paid uh, engagements as well. For example, you could be reading news, you could be speaking at some places, you could, uh, you know, be developing websites for smaller companies. You could be advising smaller startups. You could be doing multiple things. I think um, those kind of gigs give you a lot of fulfillment. And to my mind, you know, they help you do your day job better. If companies don't recognize this, I think they are in serious trouble. So doing side gigs also helps people derive happiness, which helps enables them to perform their day jobs better. So I think uh, that is uh, a, a very important uh, element. And I can tell you for sure, you know, we are seeing attrition of 25% now. It used to be probably 10%, 11% at Infosys and TCS in the earlier days. Now we are seeing 25%, 30%. I can tell you with my experience that attrition level is an unambiguous indicator that people are stuck in boring jobs. They're doing repetitive work and they just are seeing it as a temporary, you know, 
place where they can make some money and get out. Rising attrition is also a sign that it's a very hot job market. It's not just yeah, not always, are... not always, not always. For example, if you go to the BPO sector, right, attrition is hundred percent. In IT services, it's twenty five percent. In BPO, it's hundred percent. You go to warehouses and e commerce companies. You know, the blue collar staff is hundred and fifty percent per annum, even more than that. So most of these cases, you know, while poaching may be, you know, an indication that people are going to competition, but it's also true that people are walking away from these jobs. and they are leaving these jobs to do completely different things altogether so that's also an indication to me you know high attrition is a clear indication that they are unhappy in their jobs and what they do based on that unhappiness can depend for example you may have no other options but hope that you know if you're quitting tcs you you can only hope that wipro may offer something slightly different to you and you can possibly live in hope and hop from here to there eventually realizing that everything is the same So I think high attrition to me is an unambiguous indicator of people getting stuck in wrong jobs, boring jobs, or extremely frustrated in at the workplace. See again, right. higher attrition is fueled by the fact that if I'm spending two three years in the organization, I can move from you know four lakhs to maybe five point five. The same three year person, if they went for an interview, there's eleven lakh job out there. Okay, so why would I not take it? Right? Because internally, my next growth because of the pay parity. Uh, conundrum that i have to get mapped to uh, let's say a 30% increase or a 40% increase i can't get a 200% increase um, but if that were possible and if uh, you are really paying for performance and potential and everything else uh, you should pay market and if the market is paying something uh, and a lot of the attrition is because of that it, it, you know people are moving because it is uh, internally it's very difficult to manage budgets um, uh, but uh, you're still happy to hire somebody from outside at the same price I just have a slightly different point of view on this. Uh, yeah. I just yeah, Hari and then Mr. Baikin. Yeah, yes. So I think you know what uh, that explanation I don't completely buy because you know you can uh, if you take the industry as a whole. For example, if you put all these IT services companies together and treat the industry as a whole, the workforce in the industry as a whole. Every company, you know, to retain people is trying to push their own people up the pyramid. So there's no reason why you know they would go out and hire somebody else at much higher compensation. I can understand startups, unicorns hiring people from these services companies much higher salaries, but I don't think there is going to be you know one IT services company taking somebody else from another IT services company at much higher salaries because everybody is trying to push their own people up the pyramid to retain them. So I think if you see the in- industry as a whole, that argument doesn't hold. and i think you know what attrition of 25% which used to be 10% is a clear indication that people are just hopping people are quitting the industry doing multiple things and bottom line is they seem to be unhappy with their jobs that's my view mr bai uh, mr bai are you there yes yes yeah, yeah. we can yeah you know you know let me let me let me take on hari a little bit If there's 25% attrition, 10% you can say people are leaving because of board job because it has been there all along, right? The upswing out of the balance 15%, maybe 10% is because of excess demand. There's a lot of demand. People are hiring and saying come over. In fact, I keep telling my startups hire the top 10 people from all the big top five service companies after they work for one year, giving them 80 to 100% increase over their salary. the top 10 they're very good people they've been trained for one year they works in projects at them at the best poaching you can do best roi come because you get very well trained highly competent people who have been in the top 10 rank after one year of performance go hire them they're easy easy game i keep telling all my startups and they're hiring so last year there excess demand so maybe the attrition will come down to 12 to 14% where i agree with hari the 10% could be because of boring jobs because chandra 95% of life is boring chandra whatever you do life is boring <laughs> you do the same things time and again and again now you are to, as a journalist you got to write stories day and again and again all the stories are not exciting but i write different types of stories so i'm not bored i'm just telling and look the poor hari you know hari had to build his old company you know and he had to do the same thing again and again there's growth lot of things yeah. life is boring we got to live with a boring life because every every minute cannot be exciting come on so <laughs> Hari, ninety-five percent of life is boring, so just live with it. Yes, <laughs> enjoy the remaining five percent. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a very small, uh, small point. Yes, I, yes, uh, I just uh, talked about it uh, a while ago about this fulfillment, uh, you know, the uh, lack of stimulating or challenging work that we are providing to our employees. So uh, possibly by uh, giving this moonlighting a proper shape in terms of the policy, uh, what is allowed, what is not allowed and where you can take permission from. So with that clarity, I think the employee's life will become work life will become a lot more holistic and the employee will be able to hold his or her head high in dignity that I am doing one main job and I am doing a few hustles yes. on the side, which I am proud of and possibly will write on the LinkedIn profile of Correct. that person will say that, hey, this is what I am doing and uh, I can build this for you, I can do this. So all of this could be both fulfilling. I would like to highly, uh, you know, advocate this. Uh, yeah, of course, there are uh, uh, points. I completely of agree with you. Yeah, so uh, of course, one can have point of view that, you know, for 45 hours, I have uh, uh, employed this guy. So this guy will be committed to me from 9.30 to 6.30, five days a week, uh, cannot look uh, here and there uh, it could be a point of view if an employer is taking that kind of a point of view i guess uh, it is just a matter of time that uh, people uh, i mean the market uh, because it's a we are operating on a almost a free market of uh, 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 demand for uh, people and supply of people so this market will determine whether that point of view is the right view or not right on that note, thank you all very much for joining us on this debate around moonlighting. We've discussed various perspectives, that I, but I think the consensus is that companies cannot be rigid about this. Yes, if you are working for a direct competitor, then that could be cheating. But otherwise, they need to be more flexible in the way they engage with employees. And employees also have to be upfront uh, with their managers and organizations. Thank you all very much for joining us on Money Control Masterclass. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.